So here we go, Alan. Look at this lot. Takes it, you back, doesn't it? It does indeed, yes. Um, that is the familiar kit, really. Yes. These we'd rather forget about, really, I wouldn't we? I think so, very much so. The Cine King um, Colortran. Absolutely appalling. Yeah. The, well, the thing I remember most about them is, to start with, you can't really control them. No. They came with different lenses. Yes. In theory, there was flood, medium and spot. That's correct. Which yeah. was just a right. name like any I other. Know, they could I have know. called them yeah. Fred, Bill and Harry, really, because yeah. it made no difference. The, the thing that was different on all of them was the colour. That's true. They were called Colortran. And, uh, <laughs> and basically, that was because they were multicoloured. I remember one time having to light in a cloister that had w white pillars all the way down. And I lit the whole lot with these colour trans. Every white pillar was a different colour. Yes. There was yeah. purple and green and white and just... But the thing is, that on the, on the ballast, as they used to call it, yeah. there was a, a colour temperature meter. Yes. And as you turned the light up, it got brighter. Yes. And the colour temperature... And the colour changed. Cha yes. Went up. Yes. Yeah. But the, f the problem was that in a domestic situation, the four lamps all came out the one transformer, yeah. which went into a... Uh, a normal domestic supply on socket. a 13 amp socket. Yeah. Now, when these ran at full rate, it was 40 amps. Bang. Bang. Yeah. Went the fuses. Yes. So, um, many, many luckily, time, we didn't right? have these for very long. So, but yeah, then we each. finished up with something we all liked a lot better. That's true. Which is what we used to call in uh, the BBC a one man kit. That's right. Which was basically, was it three or it four? Was four, of, four of these. Redheads, we call them. They're yeah. 800 or 1,000 watts. 800. 800 watts. And the two, and two kilowatt. Two kilowatts. Mm. Quite controllable. Spot and flood That's fairly right. well. Um, with barn doors and so on. The, yeah. um, they, there's something they're slightly quite different. Light. Yeah. But uh, that wouldn't get passed in the BBC. Because if I can open it up, we used to, on many occasions, the bubble, as we call it, as you know. The bulbs, yeah. The bulb in there, look, used to explode. And on one occasion, um, in a very expensive house, it scattered all over the carpet. And a new carpet had to be paid for. <laughs> and so what they, what they did, they put, like a Pyrex dish, it was a, a heat-proof yes. glass yeah. that used to go in there. So when these bulbs exploded, they never hit anybody because no. they could be quite close to uh, it the It could the be very dangerous. Yeah. I've seen it happen, yeah. Uh, the fact was that um, they were they're running at such a high temperature um, and, uh, they're, you know, they're only glass. And um, if anybody had touched the surface of the glass before they, when they put this in, a new bulb in, if you touch it with your fingers, it would go. But, I mean, this became our sort of... Workhorse kit. It did indeed, yeah. For many years. Yeah. I, I can't remember that. I wouldn't remember to put dates on it really, but it was a long period of time when yeah. we, these were the one man kit all the time. Yeah. With these lamps, because they got so hot, to diffuse them or to lessen them, you couldn't put often, um, even papers would burn eventually or the gelatine would burn. So they brought these wire meshes out, which did take the light down. They could diffuse a, a little diffuser, bit. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And uh, didn't burn. Well, I used to put uh, tracing paper across the front of these to That's soften right. the light. Yes. But it had it, it, it been burning for a few hours, you'd start seeing it going brown, brown in, the middle. in the middle. So, f if we start, I've got to know from you which film we use. What film you're going to well, we, use? Most of the film we used for a long period of time, the standard film was, was, was uh, tungsten balance. It was, it was balanced for, for artificial light, which is what, uh, 3,200 uh, 3, Kelvin? That's, uh, that's and, correct, yeah. And, um, but so if you went outdoors, then you had to put filter on the camera. And that, but also you had to filter the lights to turn these sort of lights, which are incandescent. And the, these are 3,200 Kelvin. So they, you are looking to convert that to daylight, which means getting up to 5,600 Kelvin and, uh, and make it match daylight. Otherwise, you put that on somebody's face in, out in the daylight mm -hmm. and you finish up with blue there and, and orange here. The worst thing really is to, um, for us, is for the pair of us to make a mistake. And I light it for incandescent, and David has got uh, filming for daylight. 
and uh, the two are... We did have daylight film as well, which, which yeah. we used, not, we did use in, in, in daylight situations, and of course if you're using a daylight film indoors, then you had to filter that to match, yeah. so it's always playing one against the other, mm -hmm. and always fighting for light, never enough, we never had enough, especially yeah. once you've got to start filtering both a camera and a light, every and time you put a filter on you cut down the level of light. There's the crocodile clips. Put the filter on the front of the barn doors with these and we put one on each door like this and try and keep it as tight as possible and that's what we'd, we'd put the filter on with that. The sparks would usually have these already cut in a, yeah. in a folder or whatever for different sizes of lamps. And let's say, for instance say that there's a lot of sunlight coming through the window of this house and it'd be too bright then we use neutral density which is this the same as your sunglasses really and um, this will go over the window and if again uh, the cameraman was on in incandescent then we'd have to put this across the window and this one uh, which is an 85 so the sun now becomes incandescent through the window. That had its own problems because being a gelatine, no matter how carefully it was put on the window, it would have, it would have crinkles and creases in it. And wherever you put a light, you'd get this dreadful light picking up on, the, on those things. On top of that, the slightest breeze and they'd crackle. So filter was important, very important actually. Um, and but it did have problems when you fix it to windows. You know, it could be a sound problem if you didn't get it on the window correctly because it would start to flutter and uh, give you a lot of problems with the, uh, our gentleman of the sound department. I uh, didn't like it. Made them grumpy. <laughs> it did, didn't it? Yes, yeah. It's like going into a museum. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, I haven't seen this in a long time. Oh, well, well. Well, I can't carry them things around any longer. They used to kill me years ago. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Yeah. What do you yeah, they work. You're going to just, just put a red head on it? I'll just put a head on it and just see if we can get it working and try and work out which these plugs are supposed to feed it. No, I haven't done this for a long time. I suppose we could light this set, couldn't we? Could we light this set? <laughs> well, it's even, already lit, mate. Even that well, quiet. <laughs> well, this is how it would be if it was a documentary, of course. I'll tell you what I'll do, Tommy, is I'll get my umbrella out. I was always interested in soft light. Thank yeah. you. Oh, documentaries, Man Alive. Well, what's the wattage of those boxes? Uh, 500. Oh, oh my goodness <laughs> me, that doesn't work. Do we have a dimmer on these? We don't, know. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> what do you well, think I thought is? you were ahead of the game, mate. Sophisticated. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so right. this was my attempt at soft lighting. Well, I was always looking for soft light. Um, and as I say, there was no such thing, basically. No, there were no soft light units. Um, unless you made it yourself and so it was a matter of you know finding bits and then making the other bits to make it work so you came back with an umbrella and then as I say I designed this and the department at Ealing Studios made it for me. This, this preceded things like the breeze light which are now massive as anybody in our industry would know primarily Breeze White was primarily designed again for the uh, for the uh, photographic industry, but yeah. now uh, a lot of big commercials, glossy commercials, they find they might have half a dozen breeze lights plus four or other lighting on them. Mm. So well, I mean, one thing we use now all the time is poly, yeah. polystyrene. There was no such thing see, in those days. You, nowadays, you get away with just one. Even that, even one. Even now, that's too powerful. Even too yeah, bright now. You know, the way we used to have the diffuse was quite difficult as well. All we had really was tracing paper. And what was called spun glass? And spun glass, which was spun glass was, was is illegal now anyway. Oh yeah. But tracing paper, which was around because there was such so much heat generated, 
that you were continuously changing the trace paper. So there was all mm. directors would get angry, DOPs oh, would absolutely. get angry, everybody would get angry. And uh, well, in the end, you put it on wooden frames to yeah, keep it away from the light, frames, source, yeah. which will give you a, a softer light anyway. Yeah, you know, to find different ways of, of creating soft light. It was also to use bed sheets. You just hang them up. I mean, it looks like a Chinese laundry when I'm lighting, but it's also <laughs> it gives you a soft mm. ambient light. Um, which is virtually shadowless. And, and of course, when people walk into it, it doesn't mean you have to keep relighting. So that was the soft light. So when we went to do interviews, I'd just take this with me and Tommy and the boys would set it up um, or the equivalent of it. I yeah. mean, I only ever had this one, yeah. which was basically all you needed. Thank God for that. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, I don't know what, what we would have done if it had a few more. <laughs> <laughs> it drove, drove us all round the bed, but it was effective. Doesn't it? Well, it worked. It was great, and it and was it a great. Uh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. But these nothing. were the kind of starters. You know, there was nothing around. We had to well, on a we, flyer all the time. <laughs> we were making up as we went along, basically. Yeah. The I mean, if you're talking about um, the actual time for setting up traditionally, if you're going to an ordinary domestic environment and you're going to do an interview with somebody, then. Uh, Usually the director, myself, and the Sparks would go in and quickly, very quickly decide where we're, how we're going to film it, where we're going to put the chair. Um, and then Anna and I would get it lit. And with, with this sort of kit, you're talking about as little as 20 minutes. It mm. could be a bit, depending on other problems, but yeah. you, could, you could do it that quickly. What I would always use, and I suspect we haven't got it here today, is that I would have a, a, a three or four by four piece of poly. Polystyrene, yes. Yeah. And I have that behind the camera with mm. the 2K bounced on it. Now that was my fill light. And the, then apart from that, there would just be- Kick a, lights on. There would be, a, be a, light, a key light on the, on, the, on the face, fill light from the poly, a bit mm. of backlight on the opposite side to the key light. And then if the background needs a bit of light, another one for that. But that was pretty quick. And that, was, that would light mm. a talking head as far as I was concerned. The beauty of using very soft light as a fill light behind the camera is, again, you're making the sound line your best friend. Because with a hard light behind the camera, the, 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 you have a hell of a job to get the, the microphone out of, uh, not creating a shadow in, in the yeah, set. Yeah. And the, uh, for sound department, generally in all filming, whether it was a t filming a talking head or even a drama interior. You forgot one thing? What? Glasses. Oh, yes. Well. Person wears glasses, you've got a problem there as well. Well, you've got to make everything a lot higher usually, mm. which can be annoying because you finish up with shadows under the under the nose. But that's mm. the only way around it. Is um, I mean, actors learnt, of course, if they're wearing glasses, they learnt to have special glasses, which had actually had they had them t the t well, the glass tilted downwards a bit, and that that solved the problem. If you're an actor who was on set all the time, but if you're filming an ordinary member of the public with glasses, yes, it could be a problem. And all you could do was was put the lights a lot higher and hope they didn't tip their head up too much. But Bald then, headed people, we've got to take that into account. Yes. You know? Yes, with, with the backlight especially, yeah. 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 And what was that the question of eyebrows? So there was a cameraman that had a special term, he called them certain, uh, like Grecian arches or something. You must get the light under. The, I mean, <laughs> it's we true. We all have our quirks. They're the, windows, <laughs> they're the windows of the soul, aren't they? Actors act with their eyes. Yeah. And uh, many times you have you, if you're doing a dramatic scene, this little chap would, would come into use the inky. for the Inky Dinky, the Queen's favourite lamp. Um, this would come into use. Uh, and David would, Lean's favourite lamp, apparently. Yeah, evidently, yeah. yeah. And it would put that little white point of light onto the eyeball and uh, just gives it that you know atmosphere. It's good. It will also for people that have got a few lines around here. You know, it helps to remove them. Put a paper in that, an mm. eighty-five or whatever you wanted. And um, the, the, I don't know whether it's pertinent at this point, but the, the the history of why that's called an inky is quite interesting. It's um because this most of these funny names for lamps originally came from Hollywood. And in the early days of Hollywood, everything was lit with arc lamps, uh, which were enormous, difficult things to handle, but created enormous amounts of light, which they needed in the early days with low, slow film stocks. But 
somebody came up with this little gizmo for when you want to get a bit of a little tiny bits of light in instead of these enormous arc lights. And this was the only incandescent light on the set. So it became known as an inky. inky yeah. You didn't know that, did you, Alan? <laughs> <I didn't know. laughs> so that's why this became known as the inky, because it was the only incandescent light on yeah. the set when everything else was, was arcs. Mm. Um, and of course, the name stuck. And this is the type of lamp. I, I mean, they're basically a focusing spotlight with, it, with a Fresnel mm. lens. Was what we always used before any of this. And, and when I first started at the BBC, this is what we were using. And there were just a whole range of these. This is the smallest. At what, 300 watts this, was it? 150. 150. Mm. It should also perhaps be said at this point that the normal procedure would be that the cameraman or camera crew, no, the only per person who ever touched lights was the were the electricians. And this is not just because of what you might think today as normal health and safety regulations, though that was part of it, obviously. It was a sort of, it was a demarcation thing. And, and the sparks would get upset if, if, you, if you handled their lights, <laughs> uh, some more than others. It was health and safety, though. This does bring um, back a lot of memories. This, I mean, we look at it now, but I can see it in its boxes in a car, and I arrive at um, a location to do uh, probably a documentary and in interview, and I say, oh, it's on the third floor, and there's no lift. <laughs> And when you get all this boxed up and it's all in the back of an estate car and you've only one pair of legs and two hands, it used to be really quite hard going sometimes. You used to meet quite a few famous people when we did this, didn't we? Oh, we did, yes. 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 I mean, I remember working on a panorama and uh, they knew what I was like. So they said to me, um, on this next interview, Behave yourself. Yes, be a bit of decorum. <laughs> we want a bit of decorum out of you, Alan. So I said, all right. And I said, where am I going? I said, you're going to interview the um, chief rabbi of Israel. And we're going to go and do some exteriors, get the lights set up, now decorum. So I arrived at the chief rabbi's office in Jerusalem. I was shown into his office. Very nice chap. Would you like coffee or tea? I said, well, do you mind if I get the lights ready? And then uh, he said, no. So I got the lights ready. Then he said, come on, sit down, have your tea. And I sat down, trying to behave myself. And he leant over the desk. And he looked at me and he said, do you know any good Jewish jokes? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I know hundreds. <laughs> <laughs> and... After a while, the door opened and the director of Panorama walked in to see the pair of us absolutely rolling around in hysterics. <laughs>